As video games mature as an art form, with all the grace of your alcoholic, unmarried aunt who keeps trying to sell you Herbalife, although in this metaphor, of course, the Herbalife is dance emotes, and the alcohol is children's money, I believe it's important to try and identify what sort of stories games are good at telling. Now keep in mind, these rules are not set in stone. There are exceptions to each of them, so give your mechanical keyboard, which is bright enough to be seen from the International Space Station, Arrest. Calm down. Relax. I believe character-driven stories are a weakness, where plot-driven stories are a strength. I believe that games excel at stories where the setting is the star, and the characters and plot revolve around the setting. I believe games do not benefit from character studies, but do benefit from asking the player about their character, in the form of moral choices. I believe games excel in many ways, where Game of Thrones failed. Psych! This video is now about Game of Thrones. It's been a long time coming. I've been grinding this axe like Paul goddamn Bunyan on meth. I love A Song of Ice and Fire. They're the books upon which Game of Thrones was based. And Red Pilled. The internet has broken my fucking brain. I find The Lord of the Rings to be cringe. I've never been one for fantasy. The reasons for this are pretty straightforward. I enjoy morality being dissected, interesting settings which prompt morally difficult decisions, and righteous characters whose virtue is not an asset, it's not something to celebrate, it's a liability. What is to be done with this traitor? My mother wishes me to let Lord Eddard join the Night's Watch, and my Lady Sansa has begged mercy for her father. But they have the soft hearts of A world where the good guys are good, the evil guys are evil, and the hobbits are submissive and breedable is simply not a world which interests me. I see the appeal. I see its themes of resurrection and sacrifice and fraternity. But I'm a bitter and cynical cobbler, so you can get that uplifting shit right out of my fucking face. Gandalf the Grey was resurrected as Gandalf the White, who would use his magical abilities to destroy the filthy, evil, liberal orcs with shadow facts and logic. No price was paid. Gandalf died a good man, and came back a better one. But can a resurrection be... subverted? Lady Catelyn Stark was killed at the Red Wedding, after watching her eldest son die right before her eyes. He was a young man that had won every battle, yet still lost the war, because he chose a woman's honor over his own. Catelyn's remains were tossed into the Green Fork River, only to be found days later by the Brotherhood Without Banners. A band of outlaws which worships the Lord of Light, a god which can grant resurrection to individuals who still have a part to play in this world. Despite the remains of Catelyn having rotted in the warm river waters, the Brotherhood manages to resurrect her. All her family is presumed dead, and the caring Lady of Winterfell died with them. What was resurrected was a putrid, rotting shell of a woman, who leads the Brotherhood which continues raising the countryside which her family once ruled over, their only goal being carnage. Eventually, the Brotherhood captures Brienne of Tarth, a woman once sworn to Catelyn, who was sent to retrieve Catelyn's daughters from King's Landing using Jaime Lannister as a bargaining chip. Brienne of Tarth arrived at King's Landing only to find the Stark girls had escaped, their whereabouts unknown. Jaime Lannister, an enemy of the Stark family, sends her to find them, as he does not intend to betray Catelyn, even in death. The war is over, but the girls should be kept safe. Brienne of Tarth, when captured by the Brotherhood Without Banners, is accompanied by Podrick Payne, a Lannister squire, and is seen as a turncoat, who has forsaken her oath to Catelyn in exchange for gold. The truth is that Brienne had done all she could to find the Stark girls. The truth is that Jaime Lannister wanted nothing more than for those girls to be kept safely by Brienne. The truth is Jaime Lannister was a good man. Things I do for love. <laughs> The truth is, Brienne of Tarth would rather die than betray an oath. 
the truth did not matter. As of the last A Song of Ice and Fire book, Brienne of Tarth was being hung to death, as the reanimated cadaver of Lady Catelyn Stark looked on wordlessly. Okay, how much of this did the show fuck up? This was all in the books, and as an avid fan of them, I am contractually obligated to shit on the show at every available opportunity. Rob Stark, choosing the honor of a girl over his own. He was betrothed to a member of the Frey family, who he needed as an ally, but after being wounded in battle in the books, he is tended to by Jane Westerling, the daughter of a minor lord. He's a teenager, so, yeah. This is a one-way express trip to... To break his betrothal would be dishonorable, but to not marry Jane Westerling after would be dishonorable for her. Rob marries Jane, choosing to do the right thing over the honorable thing. This is a common theme in A Song of Ice and Fire, as the honor of an individual is really just a moral judgment imposed by society. Whereas doing the right thing, while morally correct, can be viewed as dishonorable. This is also a theme explored through Jamie Lannister and Eddard Stark. Anyway, why did Rob Stark break his betrothal in the show. You see this chick? She is hot. Very hot. Lord forgive me for the oaths I'm about to forsake. He falls in love, they get married. She's also not only hot, but the actress that plays her is actually the granddaughter of Charlie Chaplin. That's just a fun fact. Anyway, Catelyn is never even resurrected in the show. This entire sequence of events, from the beginning to the end, is just tossed in the trash because it's ugly and unpleasant and morally complex and sad, and we probably can't sell Funko Pops of Brienne of Tarth being hung by the neck by Lady Catelyn. Can we talk about the White Walkers? I've been dying to talk to you about the White Walkers. I've got boxes full of nerd rage. The ultimate trump card. The wine and the fancy talking and Bessie's tits None of it mattered. A gang of rowdy frozen fuckers were going to descend on the entire world and kill them all. Our squabbles, our endless stupid bullshit wars about fancy chairs, they, they do not matter. An existential threat, an unfathomable, and seemingly infinite horror is coming. You, you, you get it. The White Walkers becoming a non-threat, being destroyed in a single episode after years of build-up was probably done for a very simple reason. The writers had built up a massive complex web of characters and motivations, and none of that matters if the world is about to end. But that was the point. Failure to make good characters do morally repugnant things. Failure to use more complex character motivations than a wooga. Humana, humana, humana. Failure to allow the fascinating setting to alter the story in a meaningful way. Game of Thrones was a shadow of its source material, which was the salt rubbed into my nerdy wounds after A Song of Ice and Fire went on a permanent, unofficial hiatus, which is not a hiatus. The Winds of Winter will never come out. I've accepted this, much like how I have accepted the fact that all my viewers think I'm gay because I have worn a sweater and talked about how much I like Lana Del Rey. I do not like the fact that these two things are a reality, but I understand. What a baby. There are good adaptations which are faithful to their source material. There are good adaptations which are not faithful to their source material, but are outstanding in their own right. And then there are adaptations which are not faithful. Adaptations which are so woeful and poorly conceived that they rip out significant portions of their source material, but forget to add anything back in. By cutting out thematic complexity for the sake of a wider audience, the very thing that made it worth adapting in the first place is lost. So what was lost when George R. R. Martin's series was adapted by Hack Frauds? Complex character motivations. The setting barging in on the plot and making the plot look dumb. Characters being compelled through their lack of perspective into making bad slash nebulous decisions. So do you see it? No? You think I just ranted about Game of Thrones for 10 minutes because I'm off my fucking meds again? Okay, all right, that's fair. But these three things, these three story elements that made A Song of Ice and Fire so compelling, and Game of Thrones a soulless dumpster fire, 
can all be found in one game. One moment in one game. The question of whether or not to rekindle the flame at the end of Dark Souls 3 is a question that prompts some serious arguments between seriously smelly gamers. The world of Dark Souls is a world of fallen gods, broken men, and dying dreams. As you progress, the task you're set about completing falls through your hands like sand, leaving you with nothing but two terrible questions. What exactly are you saving? And can death be salvation in its own right? This all leads up to the ending choice, where you choose whether or not to let this world end, and what you choose is personal and difficult. This is a complex decision, informed by the setting and the player's interaction with it. And a first-time player still absorbing this world in all its horror may not grasp the entire story as it is withheld in scraps of lore and napkins that Vadividya has been scribbling on. I've made a video on Dark Souls 3 and this decision before, and I said in that video that I don't know the lore. That's a fucking lie. I lied to you. Miyazaki tells me the lore when he tucks me in every night. I know how Big Hat Logan got his fucking name. I didn't talk about the lore that could be gleaned from reading goddamn item descriptions because I wanted to talk about how just through the boss fights, the themes of Dark Souls are laid out clear as day. When you play a From Software game, it feels effortless, because these games lean into what makes games special. George R. R. Martin wrote the lore for Elden Ring, and this is an easy thing to sleep on, but it is what has jacked my tits. From Software does not do stunt casting, fucking Keanu Reeves is not a hologram in Bloodborne, this was done for a reason. You could be dismissive and say that all Mr. Martin wrote was the lore and world, but Dark Souls without its setting is... fucking what? It, it's so inexorably tied to that. You could set Grand Theft Auto V and Vice City, nothing would change, but Dark Souls is about its world and the cycle of fire and dark which defines it. Same goes for Bloodborne and the hunt and the blood and the doll which you may use if it should please you. I cannot imagine a better pairing as Mr. Martin already tends to write thematically engaging stories which in many ways already do lean in to what games are good at exploring. My favorite living writer working with my favorite developer that is not id Software is a hell of a pairing. It may just be that Elden Ring is that thing that communicates to everyone the promise of what a video game can be. Will the circle be unbroken by and by, by and by, is a better...